Hello there and welcome to the Second Life Book Club. My name is Draxter Dupre and today on the show, Nino Kipri. I have become a fan of Nino. I read almost all of their books and short stories. I read the Homesick Collection, just finished it up. Nino has a uh, I don't know, just astounding imagination. The homesick stories, there are floating trees that need to be captured and uh, you need to ride on them to feel freedom. There is a story about a childhood home that disappears piece by piece. There is a time traveling family that squabbles over gender pronouns. Uh, there is a world where people are ha haunted by, by incessant phone calls, by random postcards, and there is one guy who's coughing up metal keys to doors that don't exist. Uh, it's, it's, it's a world of wonder and of metaphor and of depth. And, of course, the newest novel that came out yesterday, Defect, or should I say Defect, where uh, faulty furniture in a sort of a multiverse version of ikea is hunted down by a special unit of cloned worker bees um defect is just amazing uh it's the uh, it's this in the same universe that uh nino's previous book finia takes place before we welcome our esteemed guest here i would like to have um management uh, of IKEA. I'm sorry, Littenwelt. Littenwelt. We can't say IKEA. We 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 say Littenwelt. The uh, the manager, uh, Shiloh the Super Gecko, address an important issue. If uh, the uh, the audience here uh, takes a look around, I mean, this is uh, obviously a place of work, and at a place of work, uh, health is very important. So, in the good old fashioned Second Life tradition of immersing ourselves into the worlds that we build, Shiloh will read from the Littenwelt employee handbook as it appears in Nino's new novel Defect. Go ahead, Shiloh. Checking in. How harmonious are you? The Littenveld family believes that individual voices create the most beautiful music when singing together. A single off-key note can ruin the harmony. And that's never truer than when it comes to our special, exempt employees. If you're reading this, it's because someone has raised concerns about your performance that might suggest a potential discordance. This is nothing to worry about. Feedback is a necessary part of growth. Please rate the following questions on a scale from 1, this is not at all true for me, to 5. I agree wholeheartedly and unambiguously. Emotional health. One, I am happy and fulfilled in my work and life. Two, I relish the chance to do better at my job. Three, most of my waking thoughts are devoted to improving the performance of my teammates and managers in any way I can. Four, my greatest ambition is to be an exemplary employee. Five, I do not dream. My mind is unclouded. Physical health. One, I am in perfect physical health. Two, my body does everything I or anyone else needs it to do. Three, I sleep well and wake refreshed, ready to start the day. Four, I have never experienced any of the following, illness, injury, hallucinations, phantom limb pain, personality changes, sudden hemorrhaging, or inexplicable subdermal growths. Self-perception. One, I lack nothing. Two, I am grateful that I exist at all in this chaotic universe filled with random chance. Three, I am lucky. So lucky. If you find yourself answering anything below a four, 
strongly agree. And especially if you experience any signs of illness, injury, hallucinations, phantom limb pain, personality changes, sudden hemorrhaging, or inexplicable subdermal growths, call the following number immediately and await further instruction. And that's Shyla, the manager, reading from the Litton Vale Special Employees Handbook. Thank you so much, Shyla. Of course, when you call that number and you're a precarious employee with, uh, with uh, in a hire and fire situation, they will tell you, well, go see a doctor and don't come back. I would like to welcome Nino Kipri. How are you, Nino? I'm doing well. How are you, Drax? Very good. Congratulations. Publication day was yesterday of defect. It's it's an it's a it's just an um uh, it's it's an awesome read, man. I mean, it's uh, very well done. I'm very impressed. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, it was a uh, publication day is always kind of funny just because it's very busy and also very slow. Like I just had a sort of normal day of working and I play Dungeons and Dragons and you know meanwhile like I was also like on the internet constantly and trying to remind people that I have a book out <laughs> <laughs> and I'm still getting people who are like oh I didn't know that there was even a sequel how weird so yeah so this is I mean Shyla is it was reading here from the employee handbook kind of tongue-in-cheek and you throw this this corporate speak in there uh and it's just it's just hilarious uh the the, the the, the way you you throw that in there, um, and I'm reading, I, I, I told you earlier, I'm reading a book about union organizing called mm -hmm. no, Sh no Shortcuts right now, and and this is sort of the defect, it's just a, the perfect companion read, because, you know, the, the toilet, there is a toilet. <laughs> Um, the toilet is a really important character. It's, it's a very important character. There's a, to a faulty toilet, uh, 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 must say, uh, that attacks um, one of the uh, employees of Littenwald, but then is very quickly sort of um, recruited into, uh, if you will, the revolutionary cause of of, of workers uh, unite. So, um, yeah, it's just awesome. It's it's actually probably a better book for union organizing than Jane McAlevey's Shortcuts. I don't know. <laughs> um, I heard Jane McAlevey speak. I think I because I, I so I actually used to be a union organizer. Um, oh, yeah. I was, I was just like going to ask. Wow. Yeah, I was like a rank and file organizer. I was never actually employed by a union, but um, I helped organize a union first in uh, 2014, I believe, when I worked at a bike share company that had just started up in Chicago, which is, you know, one of the reasons this these stories take place in Chicago. Um, and I did that for about a year and a half before I left to go to grad school. Um, and I was sort of thinking like, okay, you know, maybe I'll be able to like take a break from union organizing. There is a grad student union or graduate student worker union at the school, but you know, I don't have to get super involved right away. And the first thing that happened, like within, I think a month and a half, maybe two months of starting grad school is that the school uh, threatened to basically take away the graduate student health insurance plan. So we would all just kind of be shit out of luck. Uh, so like immediately like got back involved in union organizing and I didn't really stop for the three years that I was there. So a lot of the things that I'm writing about in Finna and, and Defect, I are from those experiences of being an organizer and seeing wow. the various ways that like, all different kinds of companies like really try to screw over their worker. Like, you know? I was, I was going to ask you about. Uh, uh, thank you. This 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 clears a lot up for me because the 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 various protagonists in this setting of Littenwald, this IKEA um, stand-in, you 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 paint them so well. I mean, they're they're and you know every one of us has encountered them in our various uh, jobs that we had. There there are people who are uh, just as precariously employed as you, but are very, very gung-ho and really buy into this whole, you know, this is your family kind mm -hmm. of thing, although they could fire you any minute and, and you know, threaten you uh, if you try to organize. And in your book, you have an employer who is, um, an employee, I should say, uh, Derek, who is 
um, who enjoys the work. I mean, he enjoys yeah. the work. There's there's nothing wrong with enjoying the work. He's good with customers. He enjoys building the showrooms. He gets the night shift off. Maybe there's a sense of accomplishment that he uh, makes a new showroom, you know, and then in the morning the customers come in and, and, and they like it. So and this is often uh, difficult if you are, he's he's encountering other people who find the way they are treated as workers by management and the corporate uh, executives unacceptable and in the beginning he doesn't understand that so you as an organizer actually this is an interesting question now how would you how would you get someone who's very passionate about the job and oblivious maybe or just not so concerned about the abuses how would you get that person to join let's say a union or, or, or some sort of labor action? Well, it's really, it can be really you have, difficult. You have I think... one minute. Jane McAlevey <laughs> can answer that question in 30 seconds. <laughs> okay, no. well, I'm not Jane McAlevey. She's, she's got a lot more experience than I do with this. Um, so there's two answers to that. And one is like, okay, is this person actually essential to whatever action that you're actually planning? Because there are probably a lot of workers who are not so stridently against a union or against doing any kind of action and who won't uh, kind of suck all of the energy that you need into it, like to convert them. Um, the the serious answer is like, it takes time. You can't just like, and I, I learned this as like a kind of snot nose 20 something when I was like talking to uh, coworkers who were twice my age, um, had been working these kinds of jobs much longer than me. Um, but it's not just a matter of like, you can't just find a perfect argument. Um, there, isn't, there isn't a perfect argument. Um, but what is going to mean is to just sort of like allow them to like be part of conversations and like, you know, just kind of like keep bringing it around to like, you know, you, like your experience matters here. Uh, the things that you care about matter here. Uh, we don't want to alienate you. We want to build a workplace that works for all of us and not just for some of us. Um, mm -hmm. And I think kind of like bringing it around to like, what are the things that you value about this job? What are the things that you value just in general? Like, is it working with other people? Is it, you know, that sense of pride in doing a good job? Uh, is it, you know, if you're in a customer service thing, is it actually getting to work with customers and work with strangers and like make connections? Um, so trying to find a way in through the things that they care about rather than just kind of trying to make them care about the same things that you care about. Um, and eventually sort of like bringing them on board and like making thing, kind of taking it very slowly, I guess. Like, you know, yeah. you can't just ask a person who is totally against the union, like, okay, well, can you go on strike with us tomorrow? And they're gonna say, uh, why don't you go fuck yourself? Like, but the, okay. but the interesting thing in the book, because Derek is not necessarily anti-union or anti, you know, uh, rough, roughing fetters, he just, he it, for his, uh, from his perspective, he doesn't see anything wrong with the situation that he's in. He feels he's, you know, his compensation is is okay. His working conditions are okay. And uh, I, sh I should say for folks who haven't read the book, the book uh, opens pretty much with uh, Derek living in a, a shipping container. Mm -hmm. uh, on company in, property. Uh, on company property. And he, uh, but he doesn't see that as a disadvantage. So mm -hmm. uh, it's really interesting how you paint this world um, because we feel, we feel sorry for Derek, but we also, uh, then we realize, you know, it's, uh, he, 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 like I said, he really loves his job. Incidentally, yesterday's Twitter trending top, uh, topic was an LA Times article is living in shipping containers the solution to homelessness? <laughs> I am not kidding you guys. I, I'm not surprised. Yeah. You know, the 2020s just keep being <laughs> the most. But with Derek, and this happens, I think, with a lot of other workers, is like, um, especially in sort of like more hostile workplaces, uh, workers are kept isolated from each other through yes. a variety of different ways. Like, you know, if companies say, if your employers say like, well, we're really tight knit and like, you know, we are really collaborative and like that, that is definitely true with certain companies, but like most of the companies that personally I've worked for, like they want you to be in like close collaboration, but only on their terms. Like, yeah. you know, they want you to come to the company picnic. They want you to come to like other company events, the happy hour, uh, 
whatever, they don't necessarily want you to make a lot of really close connections with the other people that you're working with. You know, they don't want you to like, for example, compare your pay rates, uh, your salaries, um, if people are getting different benefits than others. They don't want workers connecting with each other so much as like, they want to sort of like be able to insert themselves into those connections. Does that make sense? Absolutely, like, because if you can keep that separate, uh, then you just, uh, people don't even, uh, entertain the idea or so oftentimes they also don't have time with a hectic work day to really mm -hmm. kind of go like you know wait a minute isn't isn't this kind of weird uh that we uh that we can't take bathroom breaks uh, that our bathroom breaks have to be you know 4.5 minutes or whatever and if we have longer uh so these 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 things absolutely you you put yeah. this very well and that's intentionally often the workplace is intentionally designed to prevent prevent those type of um leisurely discussions, the water cooler type discussions, and especially among different sort of ethnic minorities as well. Yeah, like I think a lot, especially about contemporary work culture, it keeps us very isolated, even more so obviously right now where most of us are, many of us are working remotely, um, or there are all of these, you know, like barriers put in place to actually just having conversations, particularly about working conditions with your coworkers. Um, it's it's weird and it's thorny and it's like very difficult and both like navigating kind of like cultural expectations around it, but also like the very real um, like hostility that you face from employers when you and your coworkers start kind of comparing notes and are saying like, actually this kind of sucks. <laughs> what is going on here? We hate this. I saw this like, also really interestingly in grad school where there was no sort of like across the board um, rules necessarily about how graduate students uh, were treated, uh, what the expectations were for the kind of work that they were doing. Um, you know, I was in the English department and the very first week I was there, I started teaching, I had my own classroom. I'd never taught before. I got five days of training and then they gave me 36 students to teach. It was mm -hmm, terrifying. Mm -hmm. Um, versus like other places where, you know, you were only like grading 20 students in an enormous lecture or, um, you know, some other grad students, they didn't get their own offices. They were expected to go have meetings with students in like a break room in a building. It was very, very weird. Um, I'm sorry, like I'm just remembering all of this now. And, and the Stranger says here in the chat, some use, some management uh, use heat detectors to check if employees are gathering in the same area. Uh, that's interesting. I mean, yeah. I, I also want to say real quick, because people uh, haven't read the book, this, this book is not a, a dry theoretical uh, dissection of the of labor struggle, uh, folks. So it, just in case you feel like, oh, this is too boring for me, let me tell you, this is about multiverses Ikea, okay? You step into a weird glowing thing uh, with a sort of uh, ghost hunter type device, and then you come out the other end and there are hordes of uh, zombie training uh, video actors that attack you, okay? <laughs> Again, uh, I'm selling the book. Here. There's, there's kind of there's a furniture. Yes. Uh, what else? Um, there's, there's a pig. Or there's an armoire for pig, uh, like a pig-looking armoire for kids from Kinderveld that has eyes coming out of it. And, and again, we mentioned the toilet. Yeah, and again, there's a luxury toilet that sings Debussy and you know chases people around, and I think has like stealth capability. I thought I took that out in the last <laughs> draft, but it, yeah, no, it, can, it it can like become a chameleon and like hide in plain sight. I, the only yeah. objectionable thing I think about this book is uh, as a music uh, professional major and professional uh, and uh, who loves uh, Debussy um, that you uh, kind of uh, use his name in vain in the book is a little objectionable. But on the other hand, I know that you are ob obviously referring to a music version of Debussy that is piped yeah. into the showrooms nonstop. Yeah, yeah, I was trying to think of like who is the most like vaguely acceptable-ish classical, I don't even know if they're- Oh, exactly you're right. I mean, yeah, like, yep. but, that type yeah. of impression, uh, that type of impressionist period, that, that lends itself perfectly to, um, for a kind of a, a sound like synthesizer edition. Little mm -hmm. Brett says in the chat, even zombies I'm sold already. Yeah, that, I mean, zombies, okay. They're, yeah, it's like worker zombies. drone zombies. Um, yes. And then there's like a weird, like, 
big mama creepy monster thing that like they're all like the children of it's oh yeah the big mama really yeah yeah the big mama it's unclear if the mama is Swedish, but okay. So let's, um, if I can ask you, Nino, please um, stand up. And in front of you is is a book display um, stand with with Finia actually on it. Um, and I can put that a little closer to you, so you don't have to. Uh, mm -hmm. Our book stands they they walk towards you. Oh, if you nice. turn around to 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 your left a little bit or to your right, then you'll see it right here. Yeah, I think I can just. Yeah. Yep. Do I do that? Am I there? Nope. I'm sitting again. You're sitting. I am. Sorry. Yeah. The control of the computer. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you you can do this. You're you're you you're part of the Finia division. I know it. <laughs> Here it is. Here it is. In? Oh, and am I off the stage? Oh, yeah. I don't know where I'm going like anymore. You're good. You're good. Stand right there. Not See moving. the shelf moves just like the toilet, but it doesn't kill you. I mean, sorry, not the shelf. I mean the bo the book stand. So Finia, um, Finia is set, setting up this world, and and um, it's a little bit about starts with kind of an office romance. Yeah, so I can just sort of introduce it. Um, I'm going to read a little bit from Fina first. Um, so this is a story that follows Ava, um, who's a worker at Wittenwald, and she is called into work on her day off, unfortunately, uh, because of this, you know, character that in Fina is only referred to as fucking Derek, um, who has called off sick, and she doesn't want to come in on the day because one of her co-workers is working that day, Jules, um, and Jules also is her ex as about three days ago and they have agreed to basically never try to work together unfortunately despite trying to stay out of each other's way they both are uh, tasked with finding this customer that just randomly went missing in the store it's very weird um, and when they go to look for her unfortunately they find a portal into another universe Ava tells the manager and the manager calls an emergency meeting and that's where we're going to start with this so Trisha called an emergency meeting and everyone who wasn't working a register crammed into the break room. Can I have some quiet, please? She called out into the already quiet room. After a few seconds, she said, thank you. So for everyone who hasn't heard, we've got a moss call. There was a swell of dismayed groans and whispers. Ava, almost unwillingly, found herself seeking out jewels. They had done the same and mouthed, oh, what? Quiet, please, Trisha said again. And please hold all of your questions until the end. For the benefit of those who've joined us since our last Moss Call, I'm going to play a short instructional video. There was another groan, this one softer and more hushed. Trisha didn't even bother to shush anyone, just bent over and pressed play on. Is that a VHS player? The video began with a click and a whir. Static flickered in lines across the screen, then cleared, but the color was still slightly off, oversaturated and alien. Yellow letters traveled across the screen, marquee style. Moss Call Octu. Below it in subtitles, Wormholes, and you. The Lindenwald logo appeared at the bottom of the screen as a man and a woman walked into the shot. Judging by their hair and fashion, this video had been made before Ava was born. They both wore polo shirts in Lindenwald's signature sky blue with yellow and crimson accents, tucked into unflattering khakis with pleats where no pleats should ever be. Their hair didn't seem to move either, stuck in helmet-like structures to their scalps, which made the rest of their faces look weirdly mobile. Their voices were overdubbed, badly. What's up, amigos, said the pallid white man. His voice was a cross between Wolf of Wall Street and a California beach bum. I'm Mark. And I'm Dana, warbled the blonde. Is Dana drunk? Ava whispered to one of her coworkers. He rolled his eyes and didn't say anything. Mark spoke again. We're here to tell you what to do if a wormhole opens on your shift. Mark's voice was far more energetic than the actor, who was wan, bland in that vaguely Scandinavian way, an off-brand Mads Mikkelsen with all the interesting bits filed off. First, we should get our disclaimer out of the way, Dana said in her wobbly nasal whine. The actress moved with the confidence and poise of a piece of seaweed that had washed ashore. Littenwald accepts no responsibility or liability for any losses or injuries that wormholes incur since they fall under the Act of God clauses on our employee insurance. This training video does not replace the longer and more in-depth training for our FINA division. 
Trisha bent over and skipped ahead on the video, speeding through what looked like several more minutes of banter and or legalese. The FINA divisions were made redundant during the recession, she said. Each store handles the mosque calls in-house now. She restarted the video on a close-up of Mark. That's out of the way. It's time for a short physics lesson. In physics, the term quantum entanglement refers to particles that are linked in strange ways that we don't entirely understand, but that we can measure. Mark's pallid face with its receding hairline faded into a cheesy animation. Two blobs appeared on the screen, one a dusky pink, the other sky blue. Ava could guess what was coming next, but that didn't stop the physical pain of watching it happen. The pink blob grew eyes with heavy lashes, two spots of reddish purple appearing on what could generously be called its cheeks. The blue blob also grew eyes, along with a heavy brow and, God save them all, a handlebar mustache. Then the two blobs began flirting, cooing and blowing kisses at each other. It was the most obnoxiously heterosexual thing Ava had seen since the last St. Patrick's Day parade. Even across vast distances of space and time, Dana said in a dreamy voiceover, the two blobs were torn away from each other, flung to opposite sides of the screen with a crude galaxy projected between them. Good, Ava thought savagely, as the blobs squeaked in distress. Entangled particles find ways of reconnecting, intoned Dana, and the two blobs snaked out long ghostly limbs toward each other, joining hands across the galaxy. The two blobs burbled happily and Ava rolled her eyes. This video is making me gayer out of spite, Jules muttered clear even from the other side of the room. Quiet, please, Trisha said. On the screen, the obnoxiously heterosexual blobs had been replaced with the vapidly heterosexual actors. You may be wondering what this has to do with the wormhole in your store, Mark said. The actors' mouths always kept on moving for seconds after the end of the dub, which was giving Ava a headache. Dana addressed the camera. Some scientists believe in the many worlds theory, she pronounced it as if it were something strange and exotic, not three words that could come up by themselves in any conversation. The blue and crimson logo on screen shivered and split into two parts. Mark spread his arms, fingertips extended, augmenting the physics lesson with jazz hands. It was embarrassing to try to watch, or to watch this actor try to emote. This means that there are infinite number of universes, endless varieties of them. And that means there are endless varieties of lit involves. Dana and Mark snapped their fingers. Suddenly, they were sitting in two entirely different rooms. Hers was a lavish, baroque French drawing room, and she wore the gown and powdered wig to match. Mark sat in a room that might have been considered futuristic when the video was made. Lots of neon, inflatable furniture, and one of the largest and ugliest desktop computers Ava had ever seen. He was wearing wraparound sunglasses, a puffy orange vest, and fingerless gloves. Mark took off the sunglasses and continued. The unique layout of Littenwald encourages wormholes to form between universes. These wormholes connect our stores to Littenwald's in parallel worlds. Mark and Dana looked at each other, then snapped their fingers again. Now Mark stood in a, rusty log, in a rustic log cabin, wearing lederhosen and carrying an ax. Dana relaxed in a beach house, wearing a sarong over a bathing suit and holding a daiquiri in her hand. That is not how physics works, Jules muttered. Why was it always so easy to catch their voice? Trisha bent over to fast forward the video again. This goes on for a while, she said. You all get the idea though. They watched Mark and Dana flicker through a series of settings and costumes, some of them benign, some, b some bizarre, others just straight up racist. The bizarre zoetrope of Mark's and Dana's ended with the two actors in foam dinosaur costumes. They attempted to snap their fingers again, fumbling with their thick rubbery claws but the sound effect apparently was enough to bring them back to the original world and their original bodies. They both heaved affected sighs of relief. Now, said Mark, putting his hands on his hips, before you decide that traveling to other universes is all fun and games, we should warn you, not all lit involved are as nice as the one you work in. Dana added, here's some footage taken by one of our FINA divisions during recoveries. Ava's eyes grew wide at the shaky, grainy footage that blasted across the screen. It was hard to make out the details, but Ava caught glimpses of something enormous with far more legs than a sane universe could ask for. There were shouts and screams and what a distant, shocked part of Ava's mind guessed was Swedish. A spray of blood hit the camera and the footage cut out. Back to Mark and Dana. 
Ava broke out into goosebumps when she saw their smiles again. Now that you understand what wormholes are and what may lay on the other side of them, we're going to tell you what to do in case one opens up in your store. Mark leaned forward. After alerting your manager to the presence of a wormhole, the first and best thing to do is rope off the affected area. They'll usually collapse on their own within a couple of hours. The only time you need to worry is if someone accidentally wanders into the wormhole. Since 1989, all Litton Vault stores have been equipped with Athena, a patented piece of equipment that can locate people using quantum entanglement. It helps the FINA division in your store navigate the series of wormholes that the lost person may have wandered through. In our experience, wormholes tend to travel in packs. Trisha paused the video and then shut off the TV. He went black with a quiet pop. As I mentioned, the company closed its FINA division back in 2009 as a cost-saving measure. Instead, only two volunteers who are willing to take the store's FINA and go after the missing woman. The room went silent as every employee became intent on disappearing. Ava shrunk down into her seat and avoided Trisha's eyes. She felt a momentary pang of guilt thinking of the young woman who'd reported her grandmother missing, but Ava had no interest in death by whatever those things had been. Are we getting overtime for this? Someone else asked. Ava glanced up long enough to see Trisha shake her head. Not unless you remain in the other world past 80 hours on a single pay period, but, but, we do have a couple of pasta and friends gift cards for the brave volunteers. Ava scrunched down into her chair even further. Nobody in their right mind would volunteer for the jewels, Trisha said, and Ava felt the name go through her like an electric shock. Thank you for stepping up. Um, I'm gonna end that reading there from yeah, Fina. No, that's great. And that's, uh, yeah, that's Nino Keeper reading from Fina and, and off they go into the wormhole with Fina and uh, Yes, mm -hmm. uh, you gathered it. Fina is the, the name of the division, also the name of the device uh, that can hunt people down. And a tiny little spoiler, although I'm not going to spoil it, but if you imagine if somebody goes missing and there is unlimited uh, Littenveld out there in the multiverse, it, it also means that they're the person that is missing possibly exists in the multitude of the other universes as well right so mm -hmm. um you know who's to say if you bring back somebody else that looks very similar who's oh, no. gonna say uh, he's not the or she's or they are not the right one mm -hmm. so um i am so yeah. sorry mary carmen mary carmen uh traumatic flashbacks to gift cards after horrible shift there's a reason that i put this in there and it is because <laughs> i had like i used to get like chipotle gift cards like that was one of the things that uh, one of my employers used to reward us with, which was sort of like, kind of ironic, yeah. too. like, you know. Yeah, it's adding insult to injury. I'm, I'm sorry. I mean, when you put that in there, I think it's brilliant, you know, they get rewarded with, with gift cards. I mean, well, well, it's it's how Trisha, the manager here, sort of just, you know, uh, answers the question, do you get overtime? Well, not if you spend less than 80 hours in this other universe, but mm -hmm. we have gift cards. I mean, that's just... We have gift cards, yeah. It's unbelievable that they get away with... I mean, this is uh, this is how the real world operates for, for a lot of people who are em employed in that precarious employment. Mm -hmm. Ah, um, like, you know, heaven forfend that they get raises or, you know full-time status as workers instead of just oh. kind of kept, being kept as part-time, but you get a gift card. So you get, listen, a, a Chipotle gift card, Nino, I don't know what you're complaining about. Chipotle is excellent. Oh. $10. You can get a burrito and a very small drink. Maybe. <laughs> Okay, so real quick, and what I want to go to to defect right away uh, because th this is awesome. But uh, we talked about this earlier before the show. Uh, I was wondering if IKEA was bef was there before, or if you contemplated hey setting this story into an Amazon type mm -hmm. of situation, or were you like hey I got to do something crazy about IKEA and then sort of the the other stuff the the the, the capitalism critique and and all these other interpersonal things. Uh, uh, were were layered on top. So how how did this thing um, uh, get 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 birthed? So in late 2019 and early 2020, I was traveling a lot. And one of the things that my brain just sort of does when I travel is just makes up stories because I get very very bored. And it's kind of like my self defense mechanism is against boredom. Bored. 
boredom. That's the word against boredom. boredom. Um, it's just like a sit and kind of tell myself stories. And um, Derek in is a character is the main character of Defect and appears twice in Fina, um, but only as a kind of passing mention because you know, like I mentioned, he he calls out sick that day. Um, and I started wondering while I was traveling so much, like, what's up with fucking Derek? Um, which is the only way he's ever referred to in Fina. Uh, what's the story with that guy? And uh, we were talking earlier about, um, you know, people, workers who uh, really embrace the idea of being um, part this of is the family. My, yeah. yeah, this is my family. Uh, interesting, you know, choice of word there because that's also the way that kind of cults often refer to themselves. But you know, this is my family, I would do anything for my job, uh, I don't want a union. And so I just started thinking about like, you know, Fina is a story about a worker kind of like coming around to the realization of like, uh, I deserve better, my coworkers deserve better, like everybody in my generation deserves better and I'm gonna like leave and kind of try and find that. And then with Defect, I wanted to um, start with somebody who had a kind of a lot further to go uh, in terms of that same sort of consciousness awakening um but also like uh is sort of reconciling and, and sort of fighting with the idea of like um their own culpability in working for this company and in uh sort of like letting this uh abusive and violent system kind of happen around them and never fighting it um and that's what i wanted to write about so yeah mm -hmm. working with like i wanted to work with a character that was um far more different than my experiences, had so much more to learn and also so much more to lose, I think. Hmm. It, before we move from Defect, real quick, because this is interesting, this fascinates me and, and this is obviously very enjoyable and I think very, very uh, important and a very, very good um, a development or situation is that a lot of speculative fiction that is coming out now, and this is not a new phenomenon, there's a great tradition in critiquing uh, the system uh, and the specific system of capitalism. Mm -hmm. um, but I was just wondering, be, because here in the book club also, I mean, by complete coincidence, we had a lot of really strong uh, uh, books and stories that, that um, look at what is not working with with capitalism and they dissect it in in very deep ways but i'm wondering is there uh this is a serious question this is this is not sarcasm is 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 the anti-capitalism plot point itself commodified now it seems like i could oh, i could completely see that like there's a publisher and go like we gotta jump on this anti-capitalism bandwagon or you know or you give a book to an editor and goes like can you you know what you gotta throw in some sort of precarious worker exploitation in there and then we're good i don't think any editor has ever asked me to add more uh critique of capitalism <laughs> to my books um at least and that's personal it's just this is something that I know that I think about and worry about um and it's sort of on my mind and the way that I process those feelings is through narrativizing them like turning them into yeah. stories so I can kind of figure out my own thoughts and feelings about them but it's really interesting that you mentioned this idea about like commodifying anti-capitalist sentiment because I do think there's something there um uh, I mean, that's, I think that's truly that, like the core of capitalism is the commodification of everything. So why not the critique uh, of itself? Well, I think you see this and uh, not so much with uh, books or films or television, but you definitely see this a lot with like the self-care movement, I think, where like it is kind of commodifying this idea of just like, oh, you just need to take a break and like rejuvenate yourself and get reconnected with yourself. And you can do that by uh, subscribing to, you know, my weird mar pyramid marketing kombucha scheme or whatever the fuck. Um, <laughs> Like, so there's definitely commodification. You're giving me some good ideas. I haven't seen that. The kombucha, <laughs> the, uh, uh, kombucha the embarrassing movie. thing is that I just like looked over on my desk and like commodification or like pyramid scheme of, and like there's a kombucha bottle. <laughs> Audience here in Second like, Life, if you want to pick up this idea, you know, uh, if you know, I mean, it's the M way version of kombucha, the kombucha ver version of M way. Sounds like a good idea. Um, but I think too, like. I, I'm waiting to see if there's going to be like a Marvel movie based yeah. on this because I feel like 
you know, Disney and Marvel and like other kind of like huge, you know, story making machines like them have definitely picked up on the things like anti-fascism to make, to sort of like commodify that, which is, and when they think about commodification, it's not so much about like, you know, we're going to write or create a story about uh, anti-fascism or whatever, so much as like, we're going to kind of take the look of anti-fascism or like the most basic surface level, uh, like phrases that we can kind of parrot back at people. Yep. Uh, and like write, you know, base a story about Captain America around that. But I love Captain America, um, sort of. But like, you sort of see that happening a lot now. And I think it's really just a matter of time before uh, somebody finds a way to sell and commodify this feeling, this like antipathy about capitalism back to people. Yeah. And make a shitload of money off of it. Yep. That's that's something to look out for, for sure, folks. So, so have your have your uh, radar on. Uh, is something genuine or is something uh, out there just to um, entertain and distract you uh, further rather than actually get you uh, activated and deeper deeper into the issue? Mm -hmm. uh, so let's read a little bit of defect, if, if you will, um, Nino. Sure. Uh, again, this is Derek. If you want to set set up the set up the scene, what what are we what are we going to hear? Um, so, like I said before, um, Defect follows Derek, who calls in sick and misses everything that happens in Fina. Um, and when Defect starts, uh, Derek, is, it's actually like a day before Fina. So, like, Defect sort of encompasses like the day before and the day after those events. Um, and I think I've already talked, like, Derek is just, you know, he just really loves his job. He really just wants to do his job. Um, <laughs> and Derek is also crushingly lonely all of the time. He's incredibly isolated. He has no friends. He lives on company property. Um, and he wakes up at his day out, like after his day off, uh, comes back in. And that is where we're starting uh, with this little excerpt that I'm going to read. So I'm just going to get into it. Thank you for moving. The, of the course, thing. we spare we spare no expenses here, you know. I mean, we're in Littenwald after mm -hmm. all. I mean, you know, we uh, things move on their own ac accord. It's true. It's true. <laughs> okay. The opening shift meeting took place at the beating heart of the store, the customer service desk. Derek felt himself calming down as he walked through the winding labyrinth of showrooms. He'd always found it meditative, especially when there weren't any customers, to walk past the empty rooms. They were small and controlled universes unto themselves, steady presences after an exceedingly strange series of events. Derek's good mood abruptly derailed when he saw a showroom roped off with yellow caution tape and pardon our appearance signs. Beyond the tape, the room was in total disarray. The chair was overturned. The modular shelving was leaning dangerously to one side with its contents strewn on the ground. And was that dried blood on the ground? Zara, he hissed. His coworker had walked past it with barely a glance. What happened? Zara turned around to answer, but didn't look up from her phone. There was a wormhole yesterday. Customer went through, came back all jacked up. And only one of the associates they sent after her came back too. Apparently the other one, you know, wit. She took her eyes off her phone long enough to add air quotes to the last word. Derek felt an echo of the wild loneliness that blanketed most of his mornings, but compressed into a single super heavy point behind his, his sternum. He pressed his fist against the spot, but pressure didn't seem to alleviate it. They kept pulling his attention away from Trisha as she droned through the morning's announcements and updates. Derek. His eyes snapped up from the floor. Trisha was staring at him. Everyone was staring at him. It startled him into a fight or flight response. How can I help you today? He said, his grin feeling alien on his lips. Someone snorted. Derek felt his smile wilt a little. His throat hurt. Let's talk before the doors open, Trisha said, in my office. Derek visited Trisha's office regularly. There he received instructions and feedback, occasional praise or rewards, like getting first pick amongst customer returns that couldn't be resold. He knew that he had no reason to be nervous. He was an excellent employee. He strove always to embody lit involved values and he had a 4.74 average rating on customer service satisfaction surveys. But anxiety swamped him as he followed Trisha back to her office. 
made his palms slick and his shoulders tense. Pressure was building in his throat again. Did you enjoy your day off? Trisha asked quietly. They were in the narrow hallway between her office and the break room. I, um, <clears throat> I was sick. It, it was a sick day. Trisha smiled at him, but her eyes held a cold, contemptuous pity. Are you sure? She said. Her voice dropped to an intimate whisper. You can tell me if it was just, you know, whatever kids call it these days. A mental health day. You all need to skip work sometimes. I don't replied Derek, frankly a little insulted. I wasn't feeling well. Trisha stopped and turned to Derek, the force of her presence pressing him back into the dirty, scratched walls. Listen, Derek. This close, he could see that Trisha had puffy bags and behind the clumpy mascara. She could definitely benefit from her own mental health day. I'm listening, he said. I've already got corporate breathing down my neck because of the moss call. You being sick is the last thing my quarterly evaluation needs. She didn't add the air quotes, but she said sick the same way Zara had said quit. Is this about the sick leave policy? Derek asked, because I checked and you're not sick. You've never been sick and you never will be. You needed a personal day for whatever people do, soul searching or reading poetry or jacking off. Derek sputtered, that is highly inappropriate. Complain about it to a manager then, she hissed, silencing him as effectively as a slap across the mouth. Are we clear? You needed a day for, call it personal improvement, she said. Her voice was softer now, gentle, soothing. Repeat it, she said. Personal improvement, Derek said. He winced as he did. The words seemed to open fissures in the walls of his throat, but his voice sounded normal. Trisha eased away from him and Derek felt himself relax a little, the claustrophobia relenting as she put space between them. Is that all you wanted to talk about, Trisha? Can I go back to the sales floor? Trisha huffed impatiently. I'm not the one you're meeting with, she said. Come on. Trisha's entire demeanor changed when she opened the door to her office. The sharp, tense angles of her shoulders rounded, her head cocked at a friendly angle, and her smile went wide, wider than it ever did for customers or employees. Hey, Reagan, she said. And the woman standing by Trisha's desk turned around. She was tall, white but with an even tan that seemed out of place in the Midwestern winter, wearing a well-tailored beige suit and heels. She was younger than Trisha, her hair a more subtle shade of blonde, and her makeup a little more subtle. If Derek were asked to design a room for her, he would have put it in pastels and blush colors, overstuffed furniture with throw pillows and blankets in nice neutral tones. Hey, Trisha, she said. Even her voice was soft, not in volume, but in texture. It's great to see you. I'm so sorry to drop in on you like this. Trisha waved this off with a smile. Oh, it's totally understandable, given the circumstances. You know I'm always happy to... This must be Derek, Reagan said, cutting her off. She had swiveled her entire intention over to Derek, who felt a thrill of anxiety shiver through him. The room he'd begun building for her suddenly went a little colder. He pictured stark abstract photographs appearing on the peach colored walls, like turning around and finding something that snuck up on you. This is Reagan, Trisha said. The cheer in her voice had become brittle, from corporate. I work in resource management, Reagan said. I don't know if you remember me. I saw your, I oversaw your orientation at HQ before you transferred to Trisha's store. Derek had no memory of meeting her and that vague disquiet grew stronger at the word orientation. I'm afraid I don't he said, unconsciously standing up a little straighter. Reagan shrugged, her smile growing wider. That's fine, she said. I'm happy to see you've settled so well into your role here. Derek let out a breath, relaxing. His role here, yes, he could absolutely talk about that. I love it here, I love my job, I'm so thankful to be here. He only remembered afterwards that his sincerity had a way of putting people off, making them suspicious, but Reagan beamed at him. I'm so glad to hear that, Derek, she said. Why don't you take a seat? Reagan went around and sat behind Trisha's desk. Derek looked to see if Trisha would sit down next to him, but she seemed happy to stand by the wall, posture perfectly straight and attentive. Reagan ignored her, but Derek felt her presence behind him like a chill in the air. Trisha said you called in sick yesterday, Reagan said, pulling out a manila folder with a stack of papers in it. Uh, I just needed a, um, <clears throat> a personal day. Reagan nodded. Guess you missed all the excitement from the moss call then. Yeah, unfortunately. Why is that unfortunate? 
Trisha's presence behind him seemed to grow colder. I, uh, I would have volunteered if I had been here, and I regret that due to my absence, a member of the team had to go back in my stead, especially since one of them didn't come back. Reagan glanced over her shoulder back toward Trisha. Walked off the job, Trisha said coolly. Reagan fixed her gaze back on Derek. Okay, Derek, you missed work and one of your coworkers disappeared. How does that make you feel? She clicked her pen and set the nib down onto the paper, preparing to take notes. Lonely, Derek thought. Loneliness shook so sharp that it felt like his throat would split open from swallowing it. Reagan looked back up. What was that? Derek hadn't spoken, or at least he hadn't meant to speak, and his mouth hadn't moved. I'm not sure how it makes me feel, Derek said quickly. Um, disappointed in myself, I guess, that I left that I let everyone down. Reagan smiled again, but it was smaller now, perfunctory. You can go back to the sales floor, Trisha. I'll let you know when we're done here. When Reagan turned to look at him, he felt the force of her attention like heat prickling on his skin. He could feel sweat starting to gather in his underarms. It's normal to feel disappointed when you let your family down, Derek, she said. And we are a family, aren't we? Of course, he said. Littenwald is my family. Reagan was watching him carefully. Derek fixed his smile on his face, praying that it hadn't faltered. Reagan flipped a page in her, over in her folder, glanced down at it, and then folded her hands over the paper so, she, so he couldn't see what was written there. She leaned forward and said, I'd like to ask you some questions, if that's all right. Of course. Right. Some of these questions might seem a little weird, but just know that there's no right answer here. We just want to know what kind of baseline you're operating at. Like a personality test. Have you taken one of those before? Derek nodded a little more confidently. It told me I was the disciple. Reagan nodded and checked something off on her sheet of paper. Good, she said. Let's dive in. And remember, no wrong answers here. What we really want here is an honest appraisal of yourself. The questions that followed were weird, difficult. The pain in Derek's throat turned sharper as he confessed what kind of kitchen item he would be, a knife sharpener, and why. Necessary, helps keep other tools at peak performance and is able to take the sharpest cuts and still do his job. What did he believe that very few other people did? Uh, that hard work, kindness, and understanding would always be rewarded, eventually. Some of the questions were genuinely upsetting. If you were on a life raft with a nun, an old man, and a baby, and you had to throw one person off to save everyone else, who would you choose? Reagan asked. Do I have to throw someone off the boat? Why can't we fix the underlying problem? Answer the question, Reagan said. What background does each adult have? Do they have skills? There's no additional information, Reagan said. You have to choose one person on the boat to drown. Can any of them swim? Why can't we draw straws? Time's up, Derek. Who are you throwing out of the boat? Myself, Derek thought desperately. And this time he heard it. The word hung in the air between him and Reagan, softer than his normal voice and slightly muffled. He hadn't said it. He'd locked his jaw around the word the moment it came into his mind. Something had spoken it anyway. Are we running short on time? Can I, should I keep going? We, we can go over a little bit, but... Okay. Uh... Yes. I mean, okay. I, I, no, no, no. I mean, is this this is right in the middle. We can go. We can go over a few minutes. Okay. This is, okay. Your, your reading is is awesome, and this is this is a great scene. Okay. Yeah. I'm just gonna read the rest of the scene because I I do. It gets weird. Okay. Uh, something had spoken it anyway. Reagan looked up from the paper she'd been doodling on, bored with Derek's agonizing. Yourself? She asked. Who would you throw overboard? He asked feeling hotly embarrassed and full of dread. Reagan leaned back in Trisha's chair, tapping her manicured nails on the glass top of the desk. Her expression was cool and blank, impossible to read. Derek felt a flutter of panic beneath his solar plexus. What did she want him to say? He couldn't tell and not knowing made him more nervous than anything else. Well, I'm supposed to be asking the questions, she said, but for the record, the baby. Derek flinched. What? Why? A baby can't take care of itself. If everyone else died, so would the baby. Sentimentality isn't an attractive quality in upper management. She smiled brightly. Besides, it's all hypothetical. Who cares if a non-existent baby drowns? Who's going <laughs> to mourn it? Its imaginary parents? The fictional nun? The old man? She leaned forward. You? 
I'm gonna stop there. <laughs> I, I knew I, I knew it. I put it actually in the chat. I said this. I saw. <laughs> <laughs> the baby. I'm sorry, guys. I'm not that, you know, I'm, I'm not a sociopath. I just I just read the book. Th thank you, Nino. Please, uh, please take a seat. I'm going to uh, have the uh, book stand disappear here. Uh, this is wonderful. And, and I think everybody who had um, any, you know, any number of jobs uh, can can really feel this sort of relationship with, again, the manager and uh, the um, and the manager of the manager and going up the corporate ladder. I actually have your book uh, Homesick here in my hand, uh, but I'm going to take it off again. I'm going to read it in our post game uh, because, like I said in the onset, these stories are just so full of imagination. We have to we have to wrap in a in a few minutes because the uh, producing team has to go to another meeting. I would like the camera to cam around a little bit because i'm i'm not sure if we saw this if the um audience on the stream has actually seen that we are in this litten world a uh, world and the kinder world <laughs> and we also have these training videos that feature jeff goldblum and kevin pollack and other well-known people as um nina was reading earlier from uh, finia um these training videos they do exist the ikea training videos and they do exist on youtube you can hunt them down mm -hmm. and we also have around the place here a lot of this uh the corporate stuff for example the leadership lessons so if you mm. are corporate if you are management material dear audience member and you have listened to nino here reading and you feel like you can be trisha or regan uh make sure to read these um these pamphlets that are that are littered all around all around here. Yeah, the um, one that's uh, over in front of me, I can see is uh, one of the clean. Passages. Yeah, it's like, are your outcomes clean? Which I mean, I had to do so much research and just looking up like weird corporate <laughs> rhetoric around this stuff and, it, and just to write these excerpts. And it was really fun after a little while, but it was so, so very disturbing too. It, it is just, yeah, I was, I was gonna ask you, I mean, this, the, you, when you get into, I mean, we are all, again, peripherally uh, uh, know this, we, uh, we watch the news, we, we uh, sympathize and are in solidarity with Amazon workers, but um, many of us are not in these positions uh, all the time in our work life, 60 hours a day and have to be, uh, confronted with something like clean when setting goals for your team remember that the outcomes you're shooting for should be clean c mm -hmm. stands for circumscribed l stands for lofty e stands for economical a for assignable accountable and n stands for not obviously illegal mm -hmm. uh, and that's based yeah. on something i don't remember what it what it was but i was just like okay i guess corporate america really loves a uh, is it an anagram? I can't remember the word for it. <laughs> yeah, like smart goals. Thank you, uh, Zephyr. Um, smart goals was the one I think I was thinking of. We have to we have to wrap it. Nino, this is so awesome, and we we can stick around for um, another twenty minutes in the post game. Uh, I encourage uh, folks to to look at Nino's work and their short stories in particular. The home story, uh, the homesick short story collection is such a an incredible array of, of imaginative worlds that you're building. There are the cops they're gonna pick you up. The, those are the IKEA, those are the, those are the store cops. They're gonna they're gonna pick you up, man. Um, I think we're gonna get compared to like another another universe uh, somewhere. <laughs> the I was going to ask you real quick about your um, last question about the inspiration um, and the term. There is a term that my co-producer unearthed that I was not aware of. And um, that is the term slipstream. Ah, I, so we literally only have two minutes, but I'm going to throw okay. up a slide here. Uh, and slipstream was a, to uh, a term coined by Bruce Sterling. I was not aware of this term. So this is our little, um, you know, uh, uh, news you can use, uh, information you can use. Sl the slipstream genre. What is what is the difference between slipstream and and, and speculative fiction. Why is China uh -huh. Mieville, who is coming in 2022 to the Second Life Book Club, why is he slipstream? 
So with all genre distinctions, I think it's really a matter of, you know, kind of overlap rather than rigid categories. Um, and I think that's especially true with Slipstream, which by its nature is sort of um, defying or like working against uh, being e easily categorized. Um, you know, like Bruce Sterling says, like, you know, they're not mainstream, but they're not, uh, you know, genre necessarily, they're not literary genre, like it's, it's, um, it's slipping in between these things. It's sort of a liminal space um, that, and like a liminal category that um, uh, encompasses a lot, um, although nobody can really very easily define what it is or what it looks like. I can, I can say, and I, I have to cut it short here, I'm getting, I'm getting the, um... I'm getting the boot here from the producers. They're they're brutal. These producers, I'm telling you, Nino. But we'll stick around the post game. Um, Thank the, you, producers. <laughs> I I want to. Yeah, these producers are they're like Trish. No, no, I love them. I love them. Uh, the this is this is a compliment, Nino. I I I know that Slipstream doesn't make a comment on on the literary quality, but I feel now that I know that this genre exists and who is sort of the who is. Um, uh, seen as as purveyors of this genre, I do feel that there is a qualitative difference in terms of sort of ability to write good language, mm -hmm. <laughs> Inclu including yourself. So, um, Nino, thank you so much for coming, and thanks to the audience. Please, everybody, put in in chat what are you reading now? We're going to save this chat, and we'll, we'll have to find a way to kind of uh, maybe put a Google Doc that you can click on here in World, or we have a library center here on Book, uh, Book Island, too, that we're going to open. So put put uh, stuff that you're reading right now in the local chat, and we'll save it. And Nino, again, thank you, and good luck with Defect. Next is a YA horror novel that I read somewhere. Yeah, um, it's called Burned and Buried. It should be out in, uh, I think, spring of 2022. We don't have a solid date yet. This is the question that every creative person hates when you're just done with something and you go like, oh my God, you know, birth. Like, when is the next one out? Um, <laughs> you know, Nobody asks a mother that just gave birth, like, yeah, that looks nice, that baby. Where's the next one? Uh, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Nino reads A.K. Larkwood's The Unspoken Name. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful. Really, really enjoyed it. And I'm reading, as I said five times, Jane McAlevey's Shortcuts. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, we're going to wrap and we're going to hang out in the post game. The Second Life Book Club happens every Wednesday, 12 o'clock, Second Life time, 8 p.m. GMT. And uh, we're adding some dates, nonfiction stuff. And uh, the kickoff is Corey Doctorow actually interviewing David Dayan from The Prospect in June. So uh, we're adding some some more dates uh, that are non-literary, but more sort of real life issues type stuff. The show is produced by Strawberry Linden, Shiloh the Super Gecko and myself. The location manager and the master builder is Ruby Geek. Big big applause for Ruby Geek because we said at the last production meeting, oh, when Nino comes, we're just going to do it at the space station. You know, we, we don't have to do anything extra. And then we started reading the book. and we We're like, oh, my God, no, we need to take full advantage of Second Life. The mm -hmm. avatars are made by Kralos and Silas Merlin. Special thanks to Marianne McCann, AJ McDowell, Arden Schwartzman, Brett Linden, Patch Linden, Theonine, and all the moles over at Linden Lab. And oh, very important, please, if you have Linden Linden dollars uh, around in your in your um, in your pants, then put them in the tip jar. There is a tip jar out there. Put it in the tip jar. Tip the staff. And thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Next week is, I think there's one more slide. Don't we have one more slide here? Oh, here we go. Next week is the uh, wonderful author AC Wise is coming. Conversation with AC Wise. And her book, her current book is Wendy Darling. And it's, um, I understand, the dark retelling. Of course, everything has to be dark these days, right? Dark and anti-capitalist, you know. Oh, my God. Um, AC Wise with Wendy Darling, and that's next Wednesday at 12 o'clock right here on the Second Life Book Club. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>